Amen. How many excited this morning about the battlefield? Come on. My name is Pastor Gina. It's a privilege to be here this morning. We're going to continue on in the series of Battlefield. Because, you know, we are in a battle in the spirit today. Amen. Amen. If you're a Christian, if Christ has given you the tools to be a Christian, amen. How many know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? How many have the filling of the Holy Spirit? Well, can I fill you in on something? You are in a battle today. And so it's always a privilege to be able to speak at Cornerstone. I'm telling you, you guys are so good looking. I love standing next to some of you guys because you make me look so much better than I really am. Amen? Come on, I'll turn to the person next to you and say, it's the truth. Just turn to, it is the truth what he's saying. Wait, it's the truth. <laughs> now, I'm excited this morning. I was talking to Larry out there, and he was firing me up and telling me some things. And so I don't know what's going to happen today, okay? I'm usually really reserved. Sometimes I let Gino get in the way. Anybody know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I sometimes let myself get in the way. And that's the thing we're going to talk about a little bit, is, is getting ourselves out of the way and allowing God to get in us and out of us. Amen? Because we have a battle. We have things that we're fighting for. Now, how many dads are out there? I'm looking forward to Father's Day. I have a daughter, and I was so encouraged. I got a call like five minutes before service. My wife's ill, and that's not what I was encouraged about, but... My daughter called me and said, Daddy, I just wanted to talk to you before you, you preached. Oh, man, my heart was like, oh, what did you want? Do you want me to give you everything? Go ahead. Spend it all. But was, I was encouraged. Why? Because God, when you're a father, you, re, uh, you begin to realize, this is my opinion, you begin to realize how powerful the bond is. And, um, and I'm just so glad. We need to be here next Sunday morning on Father's Day. Bring your dad. Amen. My dad's here this morning. I'm so glad to see him. It's always encouraging in my life. You know, I was, I was thinking about Battlefield, and, and this came to my mind, so I'm just throwing these things out here. I remember one day when I was a, a teenager. Anybody can remember that long ago? That was a very long time ago, I think before TVs. <laughs> and I was there, and my dad had sat me down. And you know what? Right after high school... Teenagers have a tendency to slow down a little bit. Anybody can relate with me on that? Yeah. And I was really involved in athletics. I, I was in the honor roll my senior year, only time. I'm not going to brag. And, my, my, and I had graduated, and I, I wasn't doing anything. And then I went to college and tried to play some football, didn't do it, and just got lazy, wasn't working. I was not working, you know, and I really wasn't working. Like yard work, I wasn't doing anything. And I have a Mexican mom, and we're not going to get involved in that case. And my dad finally sat me down and said, son, he said, you've got two options. I don't know if he said it just like this, but something like this. He said, you've got two options. I just felt the love coming out of him. I thought for sure he was going to give me a thousand bucks to pay for my own apartment. And, you know, I felt it coming. I, I thought that he was going to get into his life savings and send me to Hawaii for a week to, get, to regroup and to find myself on the beach. To how, do, how do I work? How do I find this thing after high school? You know, this was all, I just felt it all coming. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The love of my dad and my father. And he told me, son, you have two options. Get a job or move out. <laughs> what? Hold on, are you talking to your middle son? Because I'm not the first, I'm not the youngest, I'm the most favorite. <laughs> All the kids think they're the favorite. And I turn, even turn around, is my brother behind me? He says, I'm giving you two weeks, and you're out. Yeah, right. Guess what, two weeks came? Let's all say it together. Out, I went to the house. You know what, that was the best thing. I know he probably doesn't realize, I want to, I want to focus on this this morning. That was the best thing my dad did for me at that point in my life. Because he cared enough to stand in front of his son and say, I want to tell you something that's going to be life-changing. I want to speak into your life. Because if you don't understand or grasp this right now, it's going to be something that's going to cause you to stumble later on down in life. Amen? Amen. And so that's what God is doing here on Sunday mornings. We're in the battlefield. And God wants to speak to our lives because 
He knows our future is filled with difficulties, hardships, things that may seem to quench everything about you. But God has faith in you this morning. That he knows that you can make it through. Amen? How many know God's love is, is the ultimate power? When, when Pastor Chantel was talking about something breaking out, man, I felt that. It was a powerful source of love. God wants to reach on into your heart. God wants to reach in there as far as he can and just extract all that out. Violently. Intentionally. And every time people came into contact with God, they got their feathers ruffled. They fell off horses. They fell to their knees. They wept. They were broken. They went through hardship. All these things are consistent in the Word of God. That when people came face to face with God, that's what happens. Let's pray this morning that God... That, that spirit of love will be right here. I'm serious. Let's close our eyes. And I know this is a little different, but I don't want to lose that spirit this morning that, that one of our pastors, Pastor Chantel, who's anointed and filled with God, is trying to break us out of. Dear God, I pray that the love is powerfully spoken today by the gestures by our love one for another, by the words that you've placed in my heart. This is 2012. This is the year of the extraordinary. You're believing in us to break out in 2012. That's going to get us to 2013. We're excited about it. We're wanting this, dear Lord. And we may be at the middle of the year. We may look back and say, man, that first part of the year is, is, is dissolved. It's gone. It's a memory. But what is bringing me to this 2012 now? The extraordinary that you promised those that would believe. I pray that the, the love of God will be felt that it's tangible today, that it's real, that it's anointed, that it's powerful. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How many know God has your best interest in mind? Yeah. We always don't feel that way, do we? I don't know about you, Jonah, you know, inside of... Uh, Inside of a whale's belly. I'm not sure he was saying, this is really for my good. Right? What are the three Hebrew children standing there getting, getting placed into a fiery furnace? I don't know if they were sitting there. They probably were, but I, I wouldn't have been. Saying, you know what? God has our best interests in mind. If we get made to, to turn into bacon right now, it's okay. God has my interest. The big guy's got me covered. You know, those are, the, those are the, the, the times when things are going really smooth is when we can say that. But God does really have your, in, your best interest in mind. That's right. I want you to remember, that's one point I want you to remember for today. That no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is, how confused you may seem to be, how your family may have turned against you, or you may be uh, losing your job, or you may be in the hospital, or you may not be feeling very good, and something very harsh happens in your life, you can honestly stand on this word this morning that God has your best interest in mind. Even if it seems like it's a failure. Even if it seems like it's something that's not working out. Even if it sounds like it's something that should break you. God has your best interest in mind. You know, I was years ago I was at an altar and I was, I was praying at this church and, and I saw this lady come and and she was in a wheelchair, and, and she came up, and she was crying, and some other altar call workers were praying, and they asked me to come pray with her, Pastor, come talk to her. And, and I knew who she was. I'm just sort of fast-forwarding a little bit. And a beautiful woman, this woman was a, a model at one time, and was a, a paraplegic, you know, no, paralyzed from the waist down. We just began to pray, and the question that came out of her mind, and her mouth from her heart, was connecting with her mind, and she said to me, she said, why did God do this to me? Man, she was paralyzed from the waist down. And just to tell you the story real quick, you know, years before that, she had been driving, and she had her two young kids in their car seats like a good mom would, and they were driving down the freeway, 
I mean a highway, sorry, you know, a divided highway. And the kids were asking for something. You know, moms are multitasking, and we want to reach for bottles, and we want to do this, and, and drive at the same time, and, and you know what's going to happen. And so she couldn't reach the, the bag, and, and the kids were asking for snacks. And so she, she made this decision that was a life-changing decision. She said, I'm going to disconnect my belt, my seatbelt, while we're driving, and I'm just going to reach around really quick. How many of you have ever done this before? We're all guilty, I think. And I'm going to do this, then I'm going to click back in and everything will be cool. But you see, that day, that decision pushed her into her current situation. And she said she disconnected her belt, just took her eyes off just for a second. And that's when a drunk driver was coming the other way. And that's when he swerved right into her and hit her head on at like 55 miles an hour. You know, how do you answer that question? Why did God do this to me? Why did this happen to me? You know, in a series of events after that, you know, her, she was married to a very prominent man, a, a wealthy man. And they had difficulties dealing with all these sudden changes. And, and she, he ended up leaving her. And, and the family uh, dissolved. And, and all the bitterness and the anger and years of building up. And here she was at this altar. And God was reaching into her heart trying to communicate with her. And as a pastor, what do you think I said to her? God has your best interests in mind. No, I didn't say that. I said, I don't know why this happened. But you know what I do know? God can turn us around for the good. Amen? Amen. I mean, see, you've got to see that happen in your life before you believe that. You've really got to. So, in the Bible, we're going to go to James chapter 1 real quick. I want to go really quickly over some verses of Scripture to prove this point. That God does have your best interest in mind. Amen? Remember that. No matter what is going on in your life, in this battle called life... When things are going on, God always has you in mind to promote you, to prosper you, to encourage you, to deliver you, to set you free, to move you forward. He isn't concerned about going back. He's not concerned about the past. He's only concerned about the destiny that you're to fill. Amen? Your destiny. You have a destiny. God has a place for you. And I'm excited about that. You know why? Because you're part of the team. Let's give it up for the Cornerstone team. Come on. Are you excited about the Cornerstone team? James chapter 1. Read it, read it briefly. It says, James is saying to us, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Something bad happens. Well, let it be an opportunity for joy. How many always just feel that when you first wake up in the morning? Ah. Oh, my problems. It's just an opportunity for joy to come out. Isn't that right, Joy? Is that what Joy, is, Karina, does Joy wake up and say, I'm in a difficult time? Oh, it's just, this is just, her house burned down. This is not an opportunity for joy. Psh! You know, that's what happened. But James is really... Not being sarcastic here, he's lived this. Why? Because he believes in God and he trusts in God. And we'll talk about that in a minute. He says, for when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. When your faith is tested. How many have faith? Yes. You wouldn't be here today. And that faith, God wants it to give it a chance. Just like a seed. That's why the Bible says he plants a seed of faith in your heart. Plants a seed. And now we have a chance to allow that. And God's going to do things that's going to cause that faith to grow. And he says here, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, I don't think that's up there, but for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for what? Anything. I want you to realize God has prepared you for anything. You may not seem like you can do anything. You may not feel like you're ready for this anything. 
But I promise you, God has enough faith, He has enough trust in you and His work that He's going to allow this to blossom out of your life. Do you believe that? I mean, really, ask yourself that question. Do you really believe that? Because the battlefield is out there. The devil really wants you back in his side. He wants you to have a, a messed up mind. He wants you to be angry. He wants you to have all these uh, things that are so... You, 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 you go through things and you, go, you, you think and say, God, did I really just say that? You really want to test your faith? Go driving somewhere and have people cut you off. How can we always... We are all... I mean, I've seen sweet, pleasant ladies lose it. One day I was in Seattle, and um, why I don't think it had anything to do with Seattle. A little crazy area, but... And we were driving, and I, I was driving, and this, this old lady, this wonderful old lady, cut this guy off. And probably was accident, okay? This is so crazy, this story. And I was like, whoa, he almost caused an accident. So the guy just got on the horn, you know, was honking at her, yelling at her. And that road rage just came out of this guy. And so this, this lady that was probably 80 years old, I know I probably shouldn't say this in church, but I'm going to because this really happened. The old lady, you know, they got next to each other, and the guy was all chewing her out. You know, I was like, man, give her a break. And she just gives the international peace sign <laughs> right at his face, if you know what I mean. She flipped him off. And, and the guy that was flipped off that received the flipping started laughing. He was like, I can't. And I started laughing. And it was an amazing thing. All of it just dissipated. Everything that was negative. Because that was the last thing you thought grandma even knew existed. Is the, did the bird actually exist back then? The internet. I don't know. She might have learned from the internet. But I don't know. But it, it, it dissipated and it, it was funny. And, and I think that we as individuals, we ought to realize that, that God is bringing situations into our lives to, to test our faith. And when that faith is tested, it begins to draw up endurance. And you begin to realize, I can do this. I can be a Christian. And you know what? I can live victoriously for God. I can live in the Spirit of God. You know, I spoke to the, the, the young lady as, as her daughter was in our youth group. And, and she brought me to her mom again in the wheelchair. And, and I, I began to realize that, man, this is the only person that can cause good out of this is God. And you got to realize that this morning, that there are going to be situations in your life that only God is going to be able to make something good come out of it. And only in his understanding are you going to ever understand that. That's the power of God. You see, the Bible says when you have faith, faith is something that will allow you to see something that hasn't happened yet. Right? You know, when I was courting my wife, it's an old term, dating. I had faith, way bigger than mustard seed that time. <laughs> faith that I was going to somehow convince her to marry me. So we did all these little crazy things. And... But see, in my, in my heart, I was convinced that by faith that she was going to say yes when I asked her. And you know what happened? She said yes. Surprisingly. So that's faith, okay? So, so let's illustrate this because I want to bring this up as a point. What's trust? We say the words faith and trust. They sometimes go hand in hand. But for illustrative purposes, I want to say trust today is something that you have gained because of a relational Comparison. For example, say I walk up to you and you're like, hey, Gino, can you let me, this is just for example, don't come up to me after church and ask me this, but I'm saying, hey, Gino, can you lend me a hundred bucks? You know, I'm going to say, in faith, I'm going to lend you a hundred bucks because I don't know if you're going to pay me back. That's one answer. Or, in trust, 
I'm going to lend you a hundred bucks because I know that you are going to pay me back because of our past experience and relationship. Do you understand how that works? Do you understand the difference? So, see, God gives us faith to believe. And as we step out in obedience and faith and begin to grow in God, we begin to trust God. Okay, get this because it's very deep. When you trust Him through the experiences, your faith begins to grow. It begins to expand. It begins to go over and bridge things that you normally couldn't cross. That's how you get to the places God wants you to be. But it only goes through a process. It only goes through time. And God begins to expand our faith. Why? Because He wants us to be at a certain place so that when we have God there, things are accomplished. And that's called obedience. Pastor was talking about that last week. Did you guys enjoy last week's service, those that were here? The power of obedience, the power of obedient life. You see, when you have faith and you mix it with, with trust, obedience naturally occurs. Why? Because you know God's gonna, God's done it before. You know how many times I've been in a, a difficult situation and I'm like, I hope God can do it this time. With that exact expression. How soon we forget how God has done it over and over and over and over. He even wrote it in the Bible over and over and over. All these people that, that have been, had faith in Him and it came to be. You see, I like in the, in the Bible it talks about a centurion. Luke chapter 7. This centurion was a Roman official. He was a Roman uh, officer. A very powerful story. And one of his servants was very ill. And this Roman officer for the military had a reputation for the Jews that he really liked them. And that he even built a synagogue for them. Now you've got to understand the, the circa that the Roman Empire had taken over that region and forcibly mandated Roman law upon them. Now that's none of us in this room I think can relate to any of that. Okay, So that, that would make you upset. So all of a sudden this Roman official... He's a military man, an officer, leads many. He went ahead and had this reputation for helping you, a smart guy. But he was intrigued by it. And so when Jesus was on the scene, he heard about him and he sent somebody. Note this, he didn't come himself. That's the first indication that there's a lot of power going on here. See, most people would reverse it and say, he didn't even come himself, why should I even bother? But the Bible goes on to say that he sent someone because he didn't feel worthy to come into the presence of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, he didn't feel it necessary to come into the presence of Christ because all Jesus had to do was say the word and his servant would be healed. How many of you ever read that story before? But there was a point for many years I didn't understand the power behind this. And it goes along with the battlefield. You see, he understood one thing, that when you have faith mixed with trust... It performs an obedient task. He understood that. It was clear to him. And I want to really put that point out because when we have a relationship with our Father, how many have a relationship with our Heavenly Father? How many have a day-to-day -day intercession with, with Christ who lives within us and the Holy Spirit who is moving in our lives and, and speaking to us daily and is communicating with us through all these different forms and outlets, people and television and, and, and just alone time. Does that sound strange to anybody right now? Because if it does, it should be something that you're, you're exercising daily. And that is odd not to have that going on in your life. But you can have that. You've got to build that culture in your life. You've got to surround yourself with people who deposit into your life. And you've got to also deposit that into your own life. Amen? Amen. You've got to be able to figure out that you need spiritual you need to receive the spiritual in your heart. You need to train yourself. You need to work yourself up. You need to get down and pray like you've never prayed before. You need to walk in the Spirit. You need to step out of your comfort zone and believe God's doing something. Why? Because you are His child. And you are second to none. And you are related to Him. And, and you are a co-inheritor with Jesus Christ. Do you realize what that means? You're rich. And famous. And good looking, probably. Someday. 
When you're a co-inheritor, it means that everything Christ has inherited, you have inherited. Everything Christ has, you have. Tell yourself that on a rainy day. That you have so much in God and you are so special and you are so wonderful. How can we have these elements deter us? How can we, because we get unfocused. And you know why we get unfocused? Because of the fact we start looking inwardly. Turn to the person next to you and say, inwardly. Okay, that's what if we have one of those signs, this is where it come up. Deep, deep, danger zone. When you start thinking about yourself inwardly, you know, when you start thinking about yourself inwardly, you start elevating yourself. You start lifting yourself in your own mind and thinking that you're more important. And then you start getting self-centered and everything around you is everybody else's fault. How many know dealing, I have an eight-year-old. And I prayed for this eight-year-old to be in my life. Why? I have no idea. But I remember I, I prayed to the Lord when my, my wife was, we were, we, were, we were trying to have a baby, and, and I said, dear God, I was real spiritual, I said, dear God, please give me a daughter, a girly girl. I just want to, like, buy her dresses and, and all the cool stuff. And a lot of stuff I didn't know what the cool stuff was. And I just... See, I grew up with no sisters, no female cousins really in my life, a mom that raised three boys. I had no idea how complex women were. <laughs> no idea. Especially at such a young age. My wife is very simple. If you guys know Pastor Ray, I'm a very simple person. Doesn't get into wearing makeup, doesn't really get into a lot of the female things. I was living in La La Land for a while. Then came my daughter to the world. Yesterday, you know how many hours I spent at the salon? Sitting there, watching her do her nails and massage her little feet that are this big? Two hours. I almost lost it. I was like, oh my God. There were a lot of Oriental people talking, you know, and I almost, I was there so long, I, I almost spoke in, in Japanese. I was there that long. I could have taken a course and, and learned something while I was there. She got her feet massaged and they were scrubbing them. I'm like, she said, there's nothing to scrub. <laughs> then she had, to, you know, I learned this new thing that the, the, the fingernails and the toenails have to be different colors or you're just not cool. Thank you, Megan. Told me that. <laughs> so she heard yeah, that. And so she had to get pink and these little rubies and these little pictures on there. And I was like, oh my God, how long am I going to be in here? I never asked for this. <laughs> but it was very complex. And so, you know, the complexities of our spiritual are very similar. And they'll pressure you, and they'll push you, and they'll stretch you. And yes, you didn't ask for some of the things that are going to happen in your life, but I promise you, it will develop in you. And, and getting back to my point, you know, we're, we're very self-centered at times when things get difficult, and we have to be stretched, and we don't want to be stretched. And we start looking and saying, it's somebody else's fault. Have you ever felt that way? Why is this happening to me? Just like the lady in the wheelchair. Why is this a... Uh, happening to me don't don't you realize it's me god and we start throwing that card up there the special one but god wants to develop us to bring out the faith in us and cause us difficulty i really believe god enjoys and listen to what i'm saying i'm going to say this in the correct term i really believe god enjoys stretching his children You know why? Because the more he challenges us, the more we have to rely on Jesus Christ. Yeah. You've got to understand this. When God the Father in his, on his throne right now, yeah. this is current. This is today. This is in Hebrews. You can read it in Romans, the epistles. When God the Father looks to his right hand, Who's on his right hand? Jesus. Jesus. And the Bible says we're in Jesus. 
that we are seated in high places. I know you guys are up there, but you're not that high. I'm talking about a higher place. God has us in a higher place. The Bible says that we are in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is so seated high, it's a representative of his authority is what I'm trying to say, that the earth is his footstool. Does that make sense? They might have a footstool, an ottoman, somewhere you put your feet on. Jesus is so exalted that the earth is like his footstool. And guess what? We're in Jesus. And guess what the earth is to us, his children, like his, uh, our footstool. And guess who's on the earth? Who is the prince and the power of the earth? The devil. Satan. The enemy of your soul. So the Bible says that your feet are on him. Come on. You're the, the conqueror of your soul. He's not the conqueror of your soul. You have authority in Jesus Christ through Christ in heavenly places. You want to get healed? You pray to get healed. You want to see a miracle in your life? Claim the miracle. Don't go running to somebody else. You say, God, it's you and I. Let's break it down and let's believe and the door is going to open. As a young pastor, they brought this young lady who had a... Something in her eye, a little, little cute little girl, like the, my, the age of my daughter. And I was a young pastor. I'm like, Pastor, look, we got to take her to the emergency. And it was all red and swollen and like something was in it. They don't know what. And she was crying. And God said, you pray for her. Because I was like, okay, let's, let's do a huddle prayer. And I was all sweating like I am now. <gasps> Are they calling on me? And God said, no. He said, you lay hands on her right now. Because my first idea was to take her to the hospital. That was my idea. And God said, no. It was out in the parking lot. And, and God just said, you lay hands on her now and you believe. Come on. And I was like, okay. And I just, it was just, a, it was a miracle. And God healed her. Come on. Why? Because I stepped out of my comfort zone. I got stretched. And I did what God wanted me to do. It was my destiny. The paths crossed. So as we close, I really want to focus on this video clip. Let me give you a little background on it. Because it's, it's about life. This is a video clip from Rocky Balboa. The last movie, we hope. <laughs> Rocky Balboa, you know him, the Italian stallion, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Really good stuff. I like inspirational movies. But this particular video clip is Rocky's trying to make a comeback. He's like 98. Not really. He's like 60. Though. He's trying to make a comeback. He's doing an exhibition. So with a current champion. And if you haven't seen the story. And so his son, however, is a young man. And his son has carried this name, Balboa, in the local community for a long time. And, and all of this he's been harassed and fussed at and laughed at. And, and now that his dad got his license again to, to, to fight, um, he really has looked inwardly and has become very selfish and, and, and has a conflict with his dad. And the words that are spoken here are very inspiring. So let's go ahead and watch that clip. Amen. Now I like how you finished there and I really want to uh, uh, end this with worship group. Come on up. We're, we're charged up. I'm charged. I love Rocky. And I love the stuff that he says. You know, because until you start believing... <coughs> That you are someone. Until you start believing that the God living within you is the power and the source of your joy and the overcomer in you, you're always going to be feeling that way. You're always going to think it's somebody else's fault. You're always going to feel that you cannot accomplish what God wants for you. But I want to let you know when you believe in Jesus Christ and you have him in your corner, you can do anything. Let's all stand on our feet. Because I'm not convinced that we believe that this morning. I'm not convinced that I'm, I'm really speaking by the Spirit this morning. I want you to close your eyes right now and just pray. Pray. 